All right, attorneys, here we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>
noise you hear is me pushing the button up here to turn it on if I talk to the lawyers at a bench conference is what it's called. That's me turning that annoying noise on. Um, it's it's uh, If I take up a legal matter with them up here, I turn it on so the jury who's the fact finders don't hear the legal issue. So we're not trying to do anything sneaky or anything behind your back. It's just the, the legal issue I take up with them. So. Uh, now also, just so you all know, if uh, after we talk to you all for a few minutes, if we decide that we're not going to uh, select you to sit on the jury in this case, we will let you know immediately if we don't need you to stay. If we do need you to stay, I'll give you some information uh, or come back, I'll give you some information about it at that time. But as soon as we're done talking to you, if we decide we're not going to select you for the jury, I hope nobody's too disappointed, but um, um, if we decide we don't need you for the jury, we'll tell you within just a minute or two, and then you'll be free to go, okay? Okay. Now, let me ask before I read this other instruction I want to talk to you about, uh, has anybody, uh, since yesterday, read anything in the media about this or heard anything in the media about it uh, since yesterday? If you have, raise your hand. If you have, 
raise your hand. If you've read something about it or heard about it, has anyone talked to you about it or attempted to talk to you about this case since yesterday? Okay, let me just identify who those are. Just one second. Right. Is it Ms. Mikuletsky? Yes, Michael Yes, Michael I'm sorry. Okay, and the nice lady behind you, Ms. Capo Bianco. Yes. Mr. Giffins? Mr. Giffins, right? I'm sorry. That's the two hardest names right there together. Raffinino? What's your name, sir? Caldwell. Caldwell, I beg your pardon. Okay. Caldwell. I'm sorry, Mr. Caldwell. This nice lady here is Miss Roach. Mm -hmm. okay. Going down. Ms. Valentine? Yes. And Mr. Trayer? Yes. That's everybody? Anybody else that I missed? Okay. All right. This other thing I want to read to you all, uh, and, and what you just told us will expedite this uh, process, I think, significantly. Now, this, this thing I'm about to read you will be the, if you're selected to serve on the jury in this case, uh, and if there's a conviction for first degree murder. Now, I'm not implying there, there will be or that there should be or I'm expecting it, anything like that. I don't want you to walk away with that impression. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not implying it should happen. I'm not suggesting I expect it to happen, anything like that. I want to make that clear. But if, in the event there is a conviction for first degree murder, the proceeding will, uh, of the trial will go to what's called a second phase or penalty phase. Now, if the, trial enter, if the trial enters that stage, you'll receive this instruction. So I want to read it to you now, the pertinent portion in its entirety, so that we don't have to reread it to everybody who comes in here when we talk to you. Okay, so I'm going to read it to you in a group. I want you to please listen carefully to it and give it some thought before we come in and ask you about it, okay? Right. Now, this is the instruction you receive if the trial goes to its penalty phase or second phase in the event there is a conviction for first degree murder. Let me emphasize again, I'm not suggesting there should be or expecting one or anything like that. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have found the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. The punishment for this crime is either death rest with the judge of this court. However, the law requires that you, the jury, provide an advisory sentence as to which punishment should be imposed upon the defendant. The state and the defendant may now present evidence relative to the, relative to the nature of the crime and the character, background, or life of the defendant. You are instructed that this evidence, when considered with the evidence you have already heard, is presented in order that you might determine first whether sufficient aggravating circumstances exist that would justify the imposition of the death penalty, and second, whether there are mitigating circumstances sufficient to outweigh the aggravating circumstances, if any. At the conclusion of the taking of the evidence and after arguments of counsel, you will then be instructed on the factors in aggravation and mitigation that you may consider. And after the closing argument be, would be presented you would be instructed as follows. It is now your duty to advise the court as to the punishment that should be imposed upon the defendant for the crime of first degree murder. You must follow the law that will, that will now be given to you and provide an advisory sentence based upon your determination as to whether sufficient aggravating circumstances exist to justify the imposition of the death penalty or whether sufficient mitigating circumstances exist that outweigh any aggravating circumstances found to exist. The definition of aggravating and mitigating circumstances will be given to you in a few moments. 
as you've been told, the decision as to which punishment shall be imposed is the responsibility of the judge. In this case, as the trial judge, that responsibility will fall on me. However, the law requires you to provide me with an advisory sentence as to which punishment should be imposed, life imprisonment without possibility of parole or the death penalty. Although the recommendation of the jury as to the penalty is advisory in nature and is not binding, the jury recommendation must be given great weight and deference by the court in determining which punishment to impose. Your advisory sentence should be based upon the evidence of aggravating and mitigating circumstances that you have heard while trying the guilt or innocence of the defendant and the evidence that has been presented to you in these proceedings. An aggravating circumstance is a standard to guide the jury in making the choice between the alternative recommendations of life imprisonment without possibility of parole or death. It is a statutorily enumerated circumstance which increases the gravity of a crime or the harm to a victim. An aggravating circumstance must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt before it may be considered by you in arriving at your recommendation. In order to consider the death penalty as a possible penalty, you must determine that at least one aggravating circumstance has been proven. The state has the burden to prove each aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to disregard an aggravating circumstance if you have an abiding conviction that it exists. On the other hand, if, after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, you do not have an abiding conviction that the aggravating circumstance exists, or if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, one which wavers and vacillates, then the aggravating circumstance has not been proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must not consider it in providing an advisory sentence to the court. It is the evidence introduced during the guilt phase of this trial and in this proceeding, and to it alone, that you are to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the existence of an aggravating circumstance may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt as to the existence of an aggravating circumstance, you should find that it does not exist. However, if you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the aggravating circumstance does exist and give it whatever weight you determine it should receive. Should you find that sufficient aggravating circumstances do exist to justify recommending the imposition of the death penalty, it will then be your duty to determine whether the mitigating circumstances outweigh the aggravating circumstances that you find to exist. A mitigating circumstance is not limited to the facts surrounding the crime. It can be anything in the life of the defendant which might indicate that the death penalty is not appropriate for the defendant. In other words, a mitigating circumstance may include any aspect of the defendant's character, background, or life, or any circumstance of the offense that reasonably may indicate that the death penalty is not an appropriate sentence in this case. A mitigating circumstance need not be proved beyond a reasonable doubt by the defendant. A mitigating circumstance need only be proved by the greater weight of the evidence, which means evidence that more likely than not tends to prove the existence of a mitigating circumstance. If you determine by the greater weight of the evidence that a mitigating circumstance exists, you may consider it established and give that evidence such weight as you determine it should receive in reaching your conclusion as to the sentence to be imposed. The sentence that you recommend must be based upon the facts as you find them from the evidence in the law. If, after weighing the aggravating and mitigating circumstances, you determine that at least one aggravating circumstance is found to exist and that the mitigating circumstances do not outweigh the aggravating circumstances, or in the absence of mitigating factors, that the aggravating factors alone are sufficient, you may recommend that a sentence of death be imposed rather than a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Regardless of your findings in this respect, however, you are neither compelled nor required to recommend a sentence of death. If, on the other hand, you determine that no aggravating circumstances are found to exist or that mitigating circumstances outweigh the aggravating circumstances, 
or in the absence of mitigating circumstances that the aggravating factors alone are not sufficient, you must recommend imposition of a sentence of life in prison without possibility of parole rather than a sentence of death. The process of weighing aggravating and mitigating factors to determine the proper punishment is not a mechanical process. The law contemplates that different factors may be given different weight or values by different jurors. In your decision-making process, you and you alone are to decide what weight is to be given to a particular factor. In these proceedings, it is not necessary that the advisory sentence of the jury be unanimous. The fact that a jury can recommend a sentence of life imprisonment or death, in this case, on a single ballot, should not influence you to act hastily or without due regard to the gravity of these proceedings. Before you ballot, you should carefully weigh, sift, and consider the evidence, realizing that human life is at stake, and bring your best judgment to bear in reaching your advisory sentence. If a majority of the jury, seven or more, determine that a defendant should be sentenced to death, your advisory sentence will be a majority of the jury by a vote of, and you'll indicate in the form the, the number, advise and recommend the court that it impose a death penalty upon the defendant. On the other hand, if by six or more votes the jury determines that the defendant should, be, should not be sentenced to death, your advisory sentence will be the jury advises and recommends to the court that it impose a sentence of life imprisonment upon the defendant without possibility of parole. When you have reached an advisory sentence in conformity with his instructions, that form of recommendation should be signed by your foreperson, dated with the date, and returned to the court. There is no set time for a jury to reach a verdict. Sometimes it only takes a few minutes. Other times it takes hours or even days. It all depends upon the complexity of the case, the issues involved, and the makeup of the individual jury. You should take sufficient time to fairly discuss the evidence and arrive at a well-reasoned recommendation. Then you would be excused to do that. Now, I don't expect you all to memorize all that. I know it's lengthy. Yeah. When, when and if you're selected and when and if we get to that point, all this will be provided to you in a written copy. I just didn't have the time to provide all of them. All this will be given to you in writing if and when we get to that point. Okay. Uh, now, do you all want to speak with uh, Ms. Grimes first? I should leave her here. <coughs> Ms. Grimes, I'm going to have you just step out so the others can get out. We're going to talk to you first. If the rest of y'all can just step over here to your room, we'll be with you short as shortly as we possibly can. I won't impose on you more than I have to, I promise. <laughs> Because Mr. Eisenhower and I indicted him for murder, I got to prove it. 
and I gotta prove it through testimony and evidence offered here in this court of law, right? Yeah. All right, so I cannot make my burden or meet my burden of proof by letting you rely on something you learned outside the court. Very simple. So with those two basic premise and legal theories in mind, let's talk about what it is you think you know about the case. Sometimes we find out a jury will talk about entirely different case, but what do you know and from what source did you obtain that information in as much detail as you can muster up? Okay, well, it would have been uh, TV news and newspaper. Um, I think they talked about it as a traffic stop. And uh, after that, the defendant went after Morales. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Morales was the police officer involved. And, um, Tuesday, I was being shopping from what the books I read. Okay, all right. And is that the, if you, that's the most detail you think you could provide? Do you have any other details or information? No? Yeah. Didn't really register a whole lot more. Okay, fine. And so, believe it or not, there's certainly nothing wrong with yours reading the newspaper, and you might be surprised to know that it doesn't disqualify you from jury service because you read the paper and know something about the case, and you're not even excluded or necessarily, excuse me, prohibited from serving if you formed an opinion. In the end, I guess I'd ask you this question. Do you think that they always get it right in the newspaper? No. Right? Because what happens is a newspaper reporter might look at facts or circumstances contained in a report or based upon a statement somebody made, and then kind of give it their own spin, right? They color things. They color things, right? You gotta sell papers, that's the business. So with that in mind, the law is, and the judge will tell you, you cannot consider anything you learn, read, or heard outside the courtroom, and that your verdict must be based solely and exclusively on what happens here in court. And for good reason, as we now acknowledge, because they can get it wrong. So my first question to you is, can you follow that law? So. Okay, you have to because this is the rule. This is what qualifies or disqualifies a juror from service, all right? So whatever verdict you render in this case, whether you say Mr. Eisenhower proved our case beyond all to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt or we don't, it must be based on what witnesses say in that witness stand, okay? Yes. And will you promise us you'll do that? Yes. All right, now, with regard to the death penalty, I don't now, I think the judge hopefully we're going to move quicker, although I guess it makes a little difference to you since you're first and you get out of here early anyway. But the judge explained, and I know it's somewhat complicated, the death penalty scheme in the state of Florida. What he just read you is the law. And it's just like what we just talked about is something that you must follow to be qualified to serve as a juror. Can you follow the judge's instructions as he read them on the death penalty? Okay, is there any hesitation or concern in your mind regarding your ability? Some jurors have strong emotional feelings about their ability to carry out their legal responsibilities in this context. Some have religious, philosophical opinions or beliefs that prohibit them from doing that. Or is there anything that would prohibit you from following the judge's instructions on the law as it relates to the death penalty? I don't think so. Okay, all right, thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. I'm sorry. Hello. I have just a few questions for you about the about the media exposure that you had before. Um, when did you when did you first learn about about this case? Was it, I believe it was what, a couple of years ago. Because Back when it happened. Yeah. And how did you first hear about it? Was it through TV or media or a friend told you? I don't remember. It would have been TV or paper. I don't remember which. Okay. Do you get the paper delivered to your home? Yeah. Which paper? Fort Pierce. Okay. And did you wind up actually reading an article about this? I would at that time. Yeah. And then during the time around when this happened, there was a pretty decent amount of media coverage, and um, there's actually been media coverage all the way up until today. Uh, do you did you follow the, the news coverage of this as it's been going along the past couple of years? Read the headlines, first paragraph, I mean, they rehash, rehash, and go the same thing. So not, not dedicated to it. Okay, all right. But it, it sounds like, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you um, you have been following the story throughout the past couple of years and, and kind of keeping tabs on it. Sort of, yeah. Uh, I teach high school, so 
and coach. So the first thing I go to is the school. Okay. And so I saw that you had checked off no, but have you already formed an opinion of, of guilt on, on Mr. Tisdale? I don't believe so. I wasn't there, and I don't know everything that went on. Did you wind up uh, getting exposed, or did you watch any of the, the coverage leading up to where we are today, uh, within the past few weeks? I didn't expect to be here, so no. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any other questions for you right now. Uh, Ms. Saladonio is going to ask you some questions about your, your thoughts and opinions on uh, sentencing Mr. Tisdale to life in prison without parole versus sentencing him to death. Okay? Thank you very much.
you, you've accomplished your goal by reading in the instructions. Right, well, let me, I may. I mean, because I don't want to get up and say anything. I'm that kind of. Okay. Did you want me to respond or do you want to hold off? I, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to do this after every person. The issue that I'm, I think that it's been working because we have had a lot of people that were middle of the road that they have ultimately become causes based on the questioning from both sides. Maybe for other reasons, but it's been standing upon the individual board eye. The people have been very um, upfront and candid with us with their answers. I do not believe we would get the same kind of responses if we had the really group setting and they would trickle into whatever the last person said. So I am very um, strongly believe that this is the only way we can get the, the honest opinion from the jurors if I have to continue this way. I understand y'all's positions. So I'm considering what I need to do later on. Let's call Ms. Jones to give us more air. You have her come in. Ma'am, up here, please. Ms. Moriarty, uh, thanks for bearing with us, ma'am. You come right up there where he's okay. indicating there in the front row on the left. You're not in trouble or anything. You haven't done anything wrong. Don't worry. Uh, they want to talk to you individually outside the presence of the other folks. So if you can just make sure you speak up for us and just be as candid with us as you can, okay? Okay. okay you can have a seat, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Moriarty. I have no questions. Thank you. I want to ask the doctors to death penalty. Okay. okay. Um, on your questionnaire, you answered you were middle of the road that you believe that there are some cases that the death penalty is appropriate and some cases the death penalty is not appropriate. Yes. Okay. You remember writing that answer? I do. Okay. And so I just wanted to do some follow up questions now that the judge has instructed you on what the law is, and I know it's a lot to take in. But prior to you coming in here today, what did you think in your mind were reasons why you think the death penalty would be an appropriate sentence? Well, it would have to be looking at what the facts were and the circumstances. Okay. Is there any cases in your lifetime that you've heard that someone got the death penalty that you said that warranted it based on the nature of the charges? I can't think of any at this point. Okay. Um, so you think you just have to look at the nature of the circumstances? I do. And what about for a life sentence? Are there any things that you feel, because remember the judge is talking about aggravators and mitigators, are there any things that you would want to hear um, before you made that decision whether or not you recommended life or death? Again, it would depend upon the facts and the circumstances. Okay, so you're open to listening to? I am. Okay. Um, if I had a scale of 1 to 10, life without the possibility of parole being number 1, and 10 being the death penalty, where do you think you are in that on that scale? After the first phase, the first phase, hypothetically, you've decided, you're on the jury, you've decided the person is guilty of premeditated murder. Okay, so the only two sentences going into the second phase are either life without the possibility of parole or the death penalty. Where would you be starting off without hearing any mitigation? I don't have, you know, until you have the information, you really can't give uh, an honest answer. I, you know, I would have to know what what the facts are. Okay. So that. Hypothetically speaking, though, if you have a scale in front of you from 1 to 10. Judge, I'm going to object. approach? Yes, sir.
taken this morning, we, uh, when I was asking you about the scale of one to ten, are you saying that you don't feel that you can give any number at this point? I do not. Okay. I, I feel like I need to know what the mitigating circumstances would be before I think it's unreasonable to give an answer. Okay. Um, I, I can appreciate your answer. Okay. Um, Nothing from the state. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Oh, Rick. Okay, we need to give her a card. Yes. Uh, Ms. Moriarty, I'm going to thank you very much for bearing with us. I'm going to give you a card with a phone number on the back here, this red card. If you'll please call that number after 5 p.m. Thursday, tomorrow. You, you're released the rest of the day today. You don't need to come back tomorrow. But if you'll just please call that number after 5 p.m., there'll be some information about what we need you to do, if anything. Okay. okay, you understand? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're free to go now, though, ma'am. Just make sure you call Thursday after 5 p.m. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, Mr. Jack. Jack, yes. Mr. Jack. Hi, uh, Eric Jack. Uh, I think really that's the best. Ma'am, up here, please. Jack, thanks for bearing with us. <coughs> right up there in the front row on your left. Right over here, please. Thank um, you very much. You know, you're not in trouble or anything, you have anything wrong, don't worry. They just want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks for just a few minutes. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. So if you'll just make sure you speak up so we can hear you and uh, just be as candid with us as you can, okay? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. So yesterday, I know it seems like a million years ago, you had indicated when the judge asked, does anybody have a problem serving as a juror in this case due to this nature of the case you raised your hand right yes i did so this is your chance to share what your concerns are with us um well my concerns uh you will ask i think that i would be able to judge i think fairly yes or something like that and um i know from remembering the case the situation i know it's a very young person okay. a young man and i am very passionate about young with young people you know, okay. and because um, I have a young son, and you know, you know, I'm thinking about the situation, the nature of the case, what it is, which way, I, in my mind, I'm thinking it might go in the opposite direction of the death penalty. I'm, I'm against that, so that has me kind of bowed out. Okay. But I'm more concerned about the young man because I know young people are so. Um, kind of crazy. I'm an advocate for young people. Okay. I have a passion for them. Well, let, let me, let's, let's start at the end where you talked about your feelings about the death penalty. You indicated yeah. my Catholic origin is against yeah. the penalty, therefore so am I. Yeah. Okay, so are you saying that your strongly held Catholic religious beliefs would conflict with your ability to follow the, fe the, the death penalty scheme that the judge read you? Yeah, that, that is kind of scary because, you know, I would never agree with that, no matter what. Okay, that's, you know. that's what yeah. we needed to know. I, I made you sit here two days to say that. Huh? And I okay. made you sit here two days to say that. <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you. Nothing further. Okay, so then. Yes, sir, I'm going to talk to her for a couple more minutes. How are you doing today? I'm very good, thank okay. you. Okay, I understand that you have a religious beliefs that, that are against the death penalty, yeah. okay? Um, are there ever, in your mind, would there ever be any type of crime out there that you believe in your lifetime that you've seen in the news or whatever, that you believe that, you know, that warranted the death penalty? No. Okay. Um, and you're saying that even if um, you're instructed in the, on the law, that your beliefs are that strong, that you cannot follow the law and that you would go outside the law based on your upbringing? Yes. And you can't set that aside at all? 
I cannot because it's it's it's, it's enrooted in me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Do you anything else with this? No, no, sir. And we would move the cause. No objection. Thank you. Ms. Jack, I'm going to go ahead and release you. I appreciate your patience with us very much. I really do. I know you've been, it's been a long day or something. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and release you. You don't have to come back unless you want to. <laughs> uh, you won't hurt our feelings if you don't. So you're free to go. We appreciate you bearing with us doing your civic duty with us. Thank you. Thank okay. you. You're free to go. Thank Ma'am, up here, please. Good morning. Good morning. See right there where he's pointing there in the front row on your left? Right here. Yes, ma'am. Now, you're not in trouble. You have anything wrong. Don't worry. You can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, they want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks for just a few minutes, so if you can just make sure you speak up so we can hear you. Uh, just be as candid with us as you can, okay? Okay. Okay. Back on. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just quickly, in your questionnaire, you indicated that uh, all you know about the case was an officer shot, nothing else. On the news, I was learning. Uh, I was on my way for work. For work, and I'm one. I do not listen to the news. Okay. If it doesn't pertain to me or my little circle of friends or family, I don't want to hear it because it's too depressing. Okay, fair enough. I am a happy-go-lucky person, and. All right. Did, can you do me a favor? And understanding that you have had very limited exposure to the case, yeah. can you tell us in as much detail as possible what it is you think you remember? Hearing and was passing. Like, and like I said, I was on my way out the door, and I make breakfast for people at work. So I like to cook, but it was you know there was an officer shot. Okay. And someone had a gun that they weren't supposed to have, okay. and that was it. Okay. And as a result of that information, you haven't heard, seen, or read anything about it since two no. and a half years ago. No, I mean I can tell you on one hand the number of times I've turned the news on and five, five Okay. Or six All right. Now, as a result of what you read, saw, or heard, your questionnaire indicates you have formed no opinions regarding the guilt or innocence of anyone. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Do you understand that the law, we, you know, you're sitting in a courtroom yes. where the law rules, not your personal beliefs, not your feelings, not your emotions, but the law, and the law says that you cannot bring to bear anything you learn outside the courtroom to the proceedings in the courtroom. Do you follow me? Yes, I do. Can you follow that law? Yes, I can. Okay, Mr. Eisenhower and I are going to call witnesses, and they're going to take an oath, and they're going to testify, and they're going to offer exhibits, and you're going to determine whether or not they're credible, and whether or not the evidence and information we presented to you is sufficient to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of his guilt. That's how it's done. Can you do it that way? Yes, I can. All right. You indicated in the death, the judge read to you a uh, death penalty, the, the, the instructions, the law on how the death penalty works. Right. Do you have any problems with that? No. Can you do, can you follow the judge's instructions on the law? Yes, I'm very good at following instructions. Okay, you're a law follower, a rule follower? Yes, I am. I abide by that law 100%. Okay, because you don't have any choice once you're picked as a jury. You I get that? Yes, I know that. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a few questions for you about the about the media exposure. Um, you said that you heard something when you were headed out uh, going to work, right? Yeah. It was just on the TV, kind of in passing. Yeah. How did it make you feel when you first heard it? I don't like any type of violence. I really don't. I am a peaceful person. Um, I don't feel anyone should take anyone's life. That's the way we were raised. The only one that should be able to take a life is the man up above. Um, and that's how I feel. I mean, right or wrong, no one should take a life. How about other forms of, of media, like for example, Facebook? Have, um, have you, are you on Facebook? I am, but most of my Facebook contacts are out of state. A lot of them are Illinois, Mississippi, Alabama, 
Indiana. Do you wind up getting the, the news feed from any of the, the local no. newspapers? No, I'm just now I'm just getting like about Donald Trump. And that's <laughs> it. But no, like I said, I I'm a happy go lucky person. I like to always stay upbeat and positive. So anything that can maybe bring me down, I don't want to hear about it. I mean my fiance gets mad, he's like, babe, you need to listen sometimes. And I'm like, why? If it's important, you're going to let me know anyhow. Or I'll hear from people at work. But I don't... I've always been like that. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, I don't have any other questions for you about media. Uh, Ms. Saldonio is going to ask you some questions about um, your thoughts on life in prison without the possibility of parole versus sentencing Mr. Tisdale to, to death. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. This is cheerful. It makes us all a little bit more fun. I've always been like that. I like it. I, I mean, I'm in an ambulance once, and they're like, Debbie, save the breath God gave you because we're, or save the breath we're giving you because you have nothing left that God gave you. And I'm trying to joke with the paramedic. Oh, that's I mean, I so want an engagement ring. I so want an introvert to the camp. Oh. And I'm just like, that's, that's great. Okay, so I want to talk to you just a little bit about the, the death penalty. Um, and, and this is the, the penalty phase um, that I want to focus on. And you said that you understood what the judge said. And I know the instructions were lengthy, and I specifically yeah. remembered you doing one of those nodding up and down yeah. when he said, we're going to give you a written if you actually get chosen and you go back there. Okay. Um, but what I want to just ask you a little bit more about your opinion, even though I know you said that you are in the middle and you could go either way. Exactly. Okay. Um, in your mind before you came in here today, were there any cases that you've experienced in your life, John, that you say, you know, the death penalty, that's one that I think that guy deserved it or that girl? You know, I have a soft spot when it comes to elderly okay. and children. Okay. So when someone harms, an innocent child. Okay. Then I think that's the mother in me that comes out <coughs> and I want to defend that innocent child or that 80 year old person. Okay. So those kind of cases would be something that you would might be leaning more towards yeah. the culpability to go towards the death penalty. Yes. Okay. Um, and, this, and the opposite of that, what kind of cases, I mean, first of all, do you think a life without the possibility of parole? sentence is a harsh enough sentence for somebody that's convicted of prison. No, I think it depends on the case. Okay. You know, the person and what was proven. Okay. Um, sometimes I think being stuck in prison, knowing you are never going to get out and have the freedom, right. kind of hurts them more. Okay. And so, once again, you're open to listening to um, okay. um, the yeah. circumstances. I like to weigh both options. Okay, so you're not close to either of them. No. And you're going to look at the individual. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. McDowell, anything else? No, sir. Uh, this one, I'm going to give you a card with a phone number on it on the back here. If you'll please call this number uh, Thursday, tomorrow, after 5 p.m. Uh, you're gonna, you don't need to stay here the rest of the day, and you don't need to come back tomorrow, but if you'll please call that number Thursday after 5 p.m. Okay. okay? Thank you very much, ma'am. We you're appreciate welcome. you very much. You guys have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Yes, ma'am. Step Step one. Step one. Step one. Step one. Step one. Step one. Ma'am, up here, please. Right, right up here. Step in, thanks for bearing with us. Right there on your left, there in the front row. And right up here, please. Thank you very much. Step in, you're not in trouble or anything. You have nothing wrong. They're just going to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks for just a few minutes, okay? And if you'll just make sure you speak up for us yeah. and just be as candid with us as you can, okay? Okay. Back in all your rest. Of the
morning. Good morning. So I thought when I saw your name, it was familiar, now I recognize you. So you weren't here yesterday, I know there was a mix up, but uh, one of the things the judge asked is, do any of the jurors know any of the attorneys? And we know we were once neighbors, correct? Correct. Okay. okay, and so I guess I should ask from the get-go, would the fact that we lived across the street from one another several years ago affect or impact your ability to be fair and impartial to the defendant in this case? I think I could be fair with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you have no, have not been exposed to any media coverage, so I don't have any additional questions. I just wanted to get that on the record. No. Okay. okay? Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Definitely. Yes. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I just want to ask you a couple questions about the death penalty phase, okay? And I know the judge gave you a long instruction, and we're, we're uh, we know it's a little cumbersome, but we know also that we're putting the car before the horse on this one, and so we want to just follow up with a couple more questions. In your questionnaire, you had to put down that you were the type of person that's going to listen to um, that some circumstances warrant the death penalty and some circumstances do not warrant the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Okay? Just make sure you answer yes or no because it's a yeah. for We know what you mean when you, but they don't. <laughs> okay. Um, so, hypothetically, I want to bring you to the, the, the penalty phase because, like I said, the car before the force, we, you have already hypothetically determined that the person that is accused has been found guilty by you and your fellow juror members mm -hmm. of first degree murder. So now we're in the second phase and the only option you have before you for sentencing recommendation is life without the possibility of parole or the death penalty. Okay? Yes. All right. So uh, what kind of information do you feel as a juror that you would want sitting on a jury um, in a hypothetical case, of course, um, to make a decision as to whether someone warrants the, the death penalty or life without parole? That's a difficult question. Um, I'm a uh, I don't know that I'm real comfortable as much with the death penalty. I, can I? Can yeah, you can say that. We want you to be open with it. Um, okay, so you're saying that if uh, you don't know any mitigators and a hypothetical question, you don't know any aggravators as you sit there, and, but you've already decided guilt, so you're in the second phase, okay? Yeah. So are you saying at the beginning, you're, would you on a scale of one to 10 be more um, leaning towards a, Say one is life without parole and ten is the death penalty. Where would you be on the number scale? It would just depend on that human being that would be in front of me. Okay, so it's really that's what I was talking about when I said what kind of things would you be wanting to hear in in that phase to determine whether or not this particular person that you found guilty it, it warrants a death penalty sentence or a life sentence, and you're saying the individual. You would want to hear about the individual. Yeah, absolutely. What kind of things about the individual would be important well, to you? Just the facts that I would hear during the case. Okay. Um, well, besides the facts of the case that you've already heard in the first phase, so you've already got that information. So what additional information would you want? Because obviously you found the person guilty of first-degree murder, so you've determined that the person premeditated it, okay? Mm -hmm. So now you're in that second phase, and you, you're going to consider that. That's going to be part of weighing it, okay? But now you want... You're going to need more. What other things do you think about that individual that would be important to you? Um, what happened? What happened? The why. Yeah. You want to you want to think that that would be important to know the why. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any other facts? All the facts that are involved in the case. Okay. So the why of the killing? Are you saying? The how? The why? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How the person got there? All the facts. You want all those questions. You want all the answers. Yeah, yeah answer I your question. Even answer question unless they have that information. Okay. You know so you, when you say the individual, do you want to know about the background, the upbringing? Um, yeah. Okay. Would you be closed off to hearing any type of mitigating circumstances, or would you consider it all before you make your recommendation? I would definitely consider it all. Thank you. Yeah, briefly, if I may, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Um, so, Ms. Saldoni was talking, he was stippling early about uh, the death penalty, and then you started to make a statement and, and then kind of got cut off, and it was something about not comfortable with the death penalty. Go ahead and tell me what you mean. Well, um, that's a huge 
accountability and responsibility in putting somebody to death. I understand if everything's there in order, that it happens, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's just hard, that's a hard decision to make. Right. So it's a very hard decision to make. Okay, and so one of the ways, the only way you can make that decision is by following, obviously, the judge's instructions on the law, and he gave mm -hmm. those to you. you We'll get them again and we'll argue them and discuss them with you. My only concern with your statement about being uncomfortable is, is your level of, could your level of uncomfortableness be so high as to affect your ability to follow the judge's instructions on the law? That's all I no, want I to know. No, I could follow those. Okay. I could follow those regulations. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Griffith. I want to make sure I pronounce your name properly. Stepley. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to give you a card with a phone number on it. Uh, if you'll please call this number tomorrow, Thursday, after 5 p.m., there'll be some information about what we need you to do, if anything. Uh, you, you're free to go today, and you don't have to come back tomorrow, but if you'll please make sure you call that number after 5 p.m. tomorrow. Okay? Thank you for bearing with us, ma'am. As soon as you give me a card, you can, you can go. Have a good day, ma'am. Thank you. Leandre Hillier, or Bobby Gleason, Leandre, Leandre, Hillary, C30. Ma'am, up here, please. Thank you for bearing with us. You just have a seat there in that front row to your left there. Thank you very much. Thank you for bearing with us, ma'am. Uh, if you're not in trouble or anything, you have done anything wrong, don't worry. They just want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks for just a few minutes. So if you'll just make sure you speak up so we can hear you and just be as candid with us as you can, okay? Okay. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Is the last name Leandre? Leandre. Leandre. Okay. So the reason we asked you in, ma'am, is because of, on your questionnaire you had indicated that you have some fairly strong personal beliefs regarding the death penalty, correct? Yes. Can you tell us what that is? I, I know what you indicated on the questionnaire is, quote, I don't believe in the death penalty, and then you indicated it's absolutely not appropriate in any case where someone's murdered, right? Okay, go ahead and tell us what the, the origin of those beliefs are. Are these religious, philosophic? Uh, the way I understand it, you know, I don't like evil to evil. So if, you know, somebody did something wrong, that doesn't mean I have to do it back to me. Okay. Because, um, okay. Yeah, I don't like that, you know. You know, there's a lot of punishment for the thing, you know. You can do this style of, you know, just to anything. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't do it people do it. Okay, so it, in regardless of what the facts and circumstances are of the case, mm -hmm. in this case or any case, you would be unable to vote for the death penalty? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, regardless of what the law and the facts say. Okay. I would feel uncomfortable. I get you. know, to do it. You know, I don't want to do something and then I regret it. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate your honesty and defense. I'm sure we'll have questions for you. I do. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a couple follow up questions from Mr. Back at all, okay? Um, you said that you would be uncomfortable choosing, uh, recommending a death sentence, okay? Because okay. you don't think evil to evil is, is something that you want to be a part of, okay? And that's your offering at that time. Are you saying that in a, you wouldn't even be comfortable in, in a case like this? Mm -hmm. And even if you were to be given the opportunity to sit on the jury, you wouldn't be comfortable even choosing a life sentence for somebody in that case? Uh, life sentence, you know, it's not, you know, that big. Okay. And All right. So you're. You know, uh, to death penalty, you know, okay. To, you know, I'm not comfortable with it at all. Okay. So it's just the death penalty part that you're not comfortable. Not that you couldn't sit on the case and listen to the, the guilt phase, the first phase, but the second phase. You're saying if those are the only options, you could not feel comfortable with choosing death. So when you say evil to evil, you're saying you believe that maybe somebody should be punished for yeah. doing evil, but not necessarily yeah. to death. But Okay, thank you very much. We move for cause, Your Honor. No objection. 
Uh, it's Lon Drake. Hope I pronounced your name properly. I'm going to go ahead and release you. I thank you for bearing with us and doing your civic duty with us the last couple of days. I hope it wasn't too much trouble for you, but I'm going to go ahead and release you. You don't have to stay or come back unless you want to. Okay? Thank you, ma'am, very much. You're free to go. Ma'am, up here, please. Right, Ms. Smith, thanks for bearing with us. You'll come right over there to your left there in the front row where he's indicating. Thank you, please. You're not in trouble or anything. You have anything wrong. They just want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks for just a few minutes. You can go ahead and have a seat. Um, so if you'll just make sure you speak up so we can hear you and just okay. be candid with us as you can, okay? Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your patience, Ms. Rose. Now, I'm Ms. Smith, Rose and Smith. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Way back yesterday, the judge mentioned the nature of the charges and if anybody had any feelings or that could affect their ability to be fair and impartial, you raise your hand. Yes. Okay, tell me what your concerns were. Um, being that I really don't know too much about the trial, just from the charges. Sure. Um, personally, it's something that um, I have a I have a lot of respect for law enforcement, okay. and I know that that would sway me into a, a different decision. Okay, so let's talk about that for just a minute. You know, this is generally something we would take up with all of you, but since you're mentioning it now, we'll talk about it. And it is what I've been saying over and over for the last day and a half: is we stand here in a courtroom, right. and in a courtroom, it's the rule of law. It's not. It's not God's law, it's not any other law, it's man's law and the rule, and the rule of law. And that is the judge's instructions on the law. And at, one, at some point in time, if you're selected as a juror in this case, what the judge will see, see what, we, what we can't have is people biased, mm -hmm. their emotions, their opinions, right, their beliefs brought to bear on how they analyze the facts of a case. And the judge will tell you, right on point with regard to your issue about respecting law enforcement, that, you know, a law enforcement officer's testimony is entitled to no more or less weight because of who he or she is or what they do. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. You ever seen bad cops out there? Not personally. Well, but there, you've seen them in the news, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So every profession has their good and their bad. Correct. Right. So what we're looking for here is a commitment from you, and it's nothing... If I ask all your fellow jurors, who's in favor of murdering cops? I don't think anybody's going to raise their hand, right? It's ludicrous. So there's, we all have those feelings and those opinions. But what counts is, can you come and sit in this box, okay? We said he murdered somebody. And we proved that through the evidence. And I'm going to call witnesses, and Daryl's going to call witnesses, and you're going to listen to them, and you're going to watch them, and some of them will be law enforcement, and some of them will be lay witnesses. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to decide what happened, okay? I've done this before. Yeah. I know you have, right? <laughs> yeah. So you know how it works. So the po my, my point to you is, regardless of your feelings about law enforcement, can you follow the law in this courtroom and render a verdict based upon what you hear and see in this courtroom and this courtroom alone? I believe I could. Okay. Okay. Um, based on the evidence. Right. And... Um, it's very, uh, Go ahead. it's very, you know, difficult case, but it has to be done. Right. <laughs> so, except uh, except for the financial hardship, yeah. for me, because I am the only sole breadwinner in the family, um, you know, I would not mind being selected. Um, it would be an honor, actually. But, and I've done it before, and it was a very good experience for me. Okay, so you're touching on something else now, you know, so i got to get to the, you know, again, these are not things we're generally taking up at this stage, but I'm sure the judge is going to want to know, and they're going to want to know, your financial hardship issue. Go ahead and say, state your piece on that. Well, I'm a licensed Medicare specialist. And October 15th is annual enrollment for Medicare through December 7th. And at that time, I usually work about 80 hours a week. We'll be done. <laughs> I, as God is my witness, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> we'll be done. So is that, okay? Is, will you, yeah. is that okay if we're done by October 15th? Well, 
you know, if you had a crystal ball, then, <laughs> then uh, I could see that, but we never know where things are going to go. Okay, then let's just assume. Yeah. And, okay. Then, then All right, so let's go back to what we talked about. It is, I understand what you're saying about it's a tough case and all of that. Yeah. You're sitting in the box. Whole case goes by. We, we prove that a, a law enforcement officer has been murdered. Mm -hmm. But we do not offer, there are two things we have to prove. A crime occurred and that he did it. Yeah. And so I put on all of this evidence, tons of evidence, mile high worth of evidence that a deputy was murdered. But I don't offer one shred of evidence that he did it. Objection, Your Honor. Are you? shred of evidence that he did it. Are you going to convict anyway just because there's a dead officer? You have to prove that he did it. Right. <laughs> because guess what? That's what the law is. Yeah. All right. So can you promise us that this case, if you're selected as a juror in this case, will be based on the facts and evidence in this case and not upon your emotions, not upon your feelings about law enforcement or anything else? Yes. Okay. I can do that. Good. Number two. You indicated in the questionnaire your feelings regarding the death penalty. Um, you said uh, you're for the death penalty, and you indicated it's generally appropriate with very few exceptions. Again, everybody's coming in here with varying degrees of positive or negative feelings towards the death penalty. And it doesn't really matter, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans, because in the end, what controls is whether or not you can follow the judge's instructions on the law as it relates to the death penalty. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. It's the same kind of rules. He read them to you. Yeah. Will you follow those rules if you're selected as a juror? Yes. Okay. And those rules require you to gate, consider aggravators and to consider whatever mitigation they might have and weigh them and then come to a decision based upon those factors. Can you do that? Yes. Thank you very much. So then. Hi, Ms. Smith. Hello. I just have some follow-up questions for you, okay? Mm -hmm. um, first, the first thing that concerns me is you, you're concerned that this is a case involving a law enforcement officer, okay? And um, we appreciate you sharing with us that you are at a point where you say that you kind of have a lot of respect for law enforcement and that kind of sways you a little bit more towards the death penalty and that's your honest opinion sharing with us, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and we understand this is a very serious um, case. case and that you said that you've had experience on juries before and that you know the process and you understand that it concerns me that when we're starting you're already looking at the case that at a different level than um, that makes me comfortable, okay? Right. So if you are chosen based on the nature of the charges because the actual information charging document says law enforcement officer, yeah. okay, so we know that's a fact, right? right? Okay, and if you're sitting up here, is Mr. Tisdale at a disadvantage if you are one of those jurors in the second phase, if you, are deter if you determine in the first phase guilt, okay? Now, 
Guilt in the first phase means you've determined that a law enforcement officer was killed with premeditated murder, okay? Because that's what he's charged with, right? Right. Okay, so the only way you get to go to that second phase where you say you strongly, you're swaying towards the death penalty is if you get that guilty verdict in the first phase, right? Yes. Okay, now the judge has instructed you in the second phase, the car before the court, okay? Um, that you have to listen to aggravators and mitigators, right? Okay. The fact that you're saying that law enforcement makes you sway a little more to death penalty, okay? Do you think that maybe this kind of a case you might be a little bit too um, biased and that maybe it might be better if it was a different type of situation, a different type of um, charge before the court? No. Okay. okay, so you think that you can be fair and impartial. Okay. Okay. So you think that you can follow the law that was instructed to you. Okay. So, let me go on further. Um, obviously, it's a murder case, right? So hypothetically, all murder is a brutal, right? First degree murder, somebody's dead, right? So, you know, right away, everybody knows that the, the victim in the case is not here, right? So that's that's where we, that's our starting point, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what cases do you feel would warrant the death penalty? What cases I feel? What kind of cases out there in the world that you've seen, heard about, made you say that there are most, most your, your answer on your question here was, with very limited exceptions, somebody that commits premeditated murder should get the death penalty. That was your, that's what you chose, right? Well, I didn't know it said premeditated murder. I meant, um, let's say someone gets in an accident and manslaughter and they kill someone. Okay. It wasn't premeditated. They okay. didn't know they were going to get in an accident. Okay, so you're saying that somebody that doesn't commit premeditated murder should get a different sentence. Is that what you're saying? Repeat that, please. Okay. The question on the questionnaire is, where are you on the death penalty? Okay? Yeah. And you put that you believe in, in, in premeditated murder, that the death penalty is appropriate. Yes. Okay. With very few exceptions. Yeah. Okay, my question to you was, um, what exceptions are you referring to? And you said to me, a case like okay. when manslaughter. Yes. Okay. Well, if it was manslaughter, then premeditated murder wouldn't have been proven to you in the first phase, right? Yes. So it wouldn't even be an option for you to go to a second phase to determine whether or not you would make a recommendation for life or death. Do you understand where I am with that? No? Okay. I know it's a little complicated. Yeah, it is. And the judge gave you the instructions on... Um, the, the sentencing phase because... Yes. I didn't know there was two phases. There, there would be two phases if the first phase is proven. Mm -hmm. And the, the charge before you was found um, as charged, first degree premeditated murder was the, the verdict, mm -hmm. okay? That's the only reason why you go to the second phase. So my hypothetical to you was is if in fact we get to that second phase, and your opinion here today is that premeditated murder, most likely yeah, the person that. should get the death yeah. penalty. Correct. Are, are you telling me that that if somebody is guilty of premeditated murder, that would pretty much be where you'd be your starting point is the death penalty? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so in listening to aggravating factors. Yeah. You have to prove it. Okay. Well, like I said, we're our, if we're at the second phase, premeditated murder's already been proven. Okay. Okay. So when you go to that second phase after you've already heard the facts, now you know this is a law enforcement officer shooting case. Right. Already. And you already told us you're uncomfortable because of the nature of the charges, right? Okay. So now I'm telling you, you you've decided the case has been proven beyond reasonable doubt in the, pen, in the guilt phase, the first phase of the trial. So now you're sitting here, you're walking into the jury room in the penalty phase. After hearing all the facts and circumstances, knowing that it's a law enforcement officer, 
and knowing you decided that premeditated murder has been the ver is the verdict, okay? When you sit in, in the jury box for the second phase, where are you as far as listening to the law and applying it to the mitigation and the aggravating factors that get presented in the, in the penalty phase? Are you, are you on a scale of one to 10 with life being number one and death being number 10? What number would you be in at the very beginning before you heard any mitigating and aggravating factors? Just knowing that premeditated murder was proven. Uh, a scale of six. Okay, a scale of six. Out of 10. Out of 10. And what kind of um, mitigating factors would you want to hear? And be presented with in order to make your determination whether or not that six goes down it could be swayed to a lower number um, when you mean mitigating do you mean uh, things pertaining to the defendant that that some kind of character issue and things like that, is that anything right? anything and everything if about there the were defendant. if there were prior records if there okay. were other convictions if there is a history of other violence okay um, those are the kind of things. Yes. What else would you want to hear about and consider? Off the top of my head, that's all, that's all I can think of. Right now. Was there any other factors that you would consider to get you to sway more towards life, or would it just continue to go towards the death penalty? Uh, maybe uh, if the person has remorse and uh, you know, is, is remorseful for what they've done and then has asked family and God for forgiveness, then maybe that might sway me a different way. Okay, well, what if none of those factors happen? Well, Judge, I'm going to object. Then it's too bad. If none of those things happen, it's... That's... You don't need any. I'm sorry, Miss Bitt. Let her ask another question. Uh, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, so you you're 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 presented with the fact that law enforcement officer has been shot and convicted because you're in the second case. Okay. Okay. And you're saying that out of the things that you would consider, um, you would be starting at the death penalty and reversing that. Yes. And it would be the, the mitigated, mitigated yeah. factors you considered or what you just told us. Um, are there any circumstances where a law enforcement officer is shot and killed um, that you would consider a life sentence? Judge, I'm going to object. I'll overrule that objection. I think that's a I, I, um, you guys really need to, you don't. Um, <laughs> I, I've never been asked that question before, and I've never actually thought about it. Right, we understand. I, I don't even watch the news or listen to the news because of these depressing uh, circumstances. I don't know. I can't answer that right now. Are there any other um, <coughs> factors that you would want to determine whether or not um, you would be leaning more towards a death sentence? It is, it is a law available in this state. So, I mean, not every state has that, I believe, but... Right, but there's only two choices, life yeah, or death. Life or death. If you're found guilty of first degree premeditated in Florida. I, I don't know. I mean, I will, I will listen. I will give my um, recommendations to the rest of the jury. Okay. Um, based on the law, and I was on a jury panel before I was the foreman. Okay, were you on a death penalty case? It was before? a attempted murder. Okay, so the option wasn't, they didn't go to a second phase. Right. Okay. It was a little bit different. Okay. Um, 
in your lifetime, were there any cases out there that you felt, you heard in, in society that you felt um, warranted um, a life sentence? The only, the only one that um, that I can recall offhand, like I said, I don't really try to get into this, was the uh, Casey, Casey Anthony's trial. And of course, she didn't get a life sentence or anything. So um, in that case, I would have liked her to get something. <laughs> so <laughs> she got nothing. Uh, it makes you wonder what's going on with our court system nowadays. <laughs> Do you have any strong feelings about the court system on the death penalty issue? I'm, I am a, um, a very strong Christian believer. I do strongly believe in the death penalty. That's just my interpretation of okay. the Bible. Okay, and um, so are you saying that the law is instructed to you um, in this particular case because you said you never sat on a case like this. As you sit here, um, are you able to follow the law as instructed here, even with your beliefs that you believe strongly in the death penalty? Well, I was, I had these strong beliefs in the last case and I had to go by the law and the information presented. So my feelings really were not able to be used into the case. I had to go by the evidence and the law. Did you get a verdict in that case? Yes. What was the verdict? Not guilty. Okay. So if you sat on a case, this case, um, and you hypothetically went to the second phase, are you saying that you could strictly set your feelings aside on your Christian beliefs? And that you strongly believe in the death penalty, and if the, the mitigation and the aggravators are presented to you, and you don't think it's sufficient on the aggravators, do you do you believe in a case involving a law enforcement officer that you could um, follow the law and, and, and recommend a life sentence if that's were the facts and circumstances presented to you for the mitigation and aggravators? I could. Okay, thank you. Anything else? No, sir. Give her a card or you can approach. Yes, give her a card. Judge, I'm going to ask her a question. Don't sit here.
I'm going to go ahead and uh, release you, ma'am. I, I do appreciate you bearing, there you are, bearing with us and your patience and doing your civic duty with us. Uh, you don't have to come back or stay unless you want to. But I do want to thank you before you go, okay? okay thank, thank you, you ma'am, very much. Have a good day. service on the jury. I do want to thank you for bearing with us the last day and a half or so and fill out your paperwork uh, doing your civic duty uh, with us. I hope it wasn't too much of an imposition on your time. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to stop talking and let you go, but thank you. Okay, where you go, man. Thank you. Farley, come in, please. Copy, Robert, Farley, Robert, Farley, C-34.
Tommy up here, please. Yeah. Thanks for bearing with us, sir. Just come right there in the front row there on your left. Take a seat right here, please. Thank you very much. Thanks for bearing with us. You're not in trouble. We have anything wrong. Don't worry. They want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks in just a minute. So if you just make sure you speak up for us and uh, be as candid with us as you can, okay? Cool. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we asked Jen here because we wanted to talk to you about a couple of things on your questionnaire. First among them was the uh, media exposure you'd had. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, uh, do you understand that, uh, or you may be surprised to know, that even if you have an opinion based on what you've seen in the news, that um, which I think that's what exactly the way you worded it on your questionnaire, yeah. uh, that uh, that opinion doesn't preclude you from being a juror. What's important is, is that you base your evidence I mean, uh, base your verdict on the evidence that we have here in the courtroom. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, because it's my job as the prosecutor, myself and Mr. Backadall, to prove that, uh, the case beyond a reasonable doubt. What we have to prove is that the crime was committed and that the defendant did it. And uh, as a juror, you, it would be your job to, to listen to the evidence as it comes out here in court through the witness stand, from testimony of witnesses, uh, telling you what they saw, what they heard, what they did, and then we would uh, introduce some exhibits as well and you would take that information to, to determine your verdict. Could you do that? Uh, I could, yeah. Okay, could you set aside what you said, as, as you said, learned on the local news? Uh, could you set that aside in determining um, what happened in this case? Um, I mean, I know I, I should, but I don't actually think that I could because I've actually, you know, prior to this, I've read a lot about it. Okay. So I've kind of, form some of my own, you know, ideas and opinions, but, right. um, And those are too strong for you to, uh, to make your decision based on what happened here in court and, for, and forget about those things? Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Another question? Uh, Mr. Parlay, I'm going to go ahead and release you. I, I do want to thank you before I let you go for bearing with us and doing your civic duty with us. I hope it wasn't too much of an imposition on your time. Uh, and you're free to go. You don't need to stay tomorrow, stay today, or come back. But thank you for bearing with us. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. Sure. Thank you. And this Rappadino come in. Chris Rappadino, sheet thirty-five. Chris You know, you're not in trouble or anything. If anything wrong, we just want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks for just a few minutes. Okay. So if you can just make sure you speak up so we can hear you and just be as candid with us as you can, okay? All right. Stay. Good morning, Mr. Graffin. You know, I don't have any questions for you at this time. Okay. Thank you, Thank Children is a, is a major one. Um, they be even, uh, molesting, raping, uh, any type of violence towards children. Um, if it's a case where someone is, um, I believe, you know, brutally, uh, maybe maybe tortured or, or, or beaten, and it's someone that couldn't, you know, defend themselves, um, 
uh, I would say if the cases would have to be pretty extreme and um, unnecessary, like an unnecessary type of crime would have to take place for death penalty to be considered. Okay. And what kind of mitigating circumstances do you think you would like to hear um, in reference to um, a case? In the penalty phase, if you hypothetically have already found the person guilty of a committed murder now at the penalty phase, you have to decide whether or not you're going to recommend life without parole or the death penalty. Okay? What kind of things would you want to know in making that decision as far as mitigation? So, what would I want to know about the individual you? that you just were part of convicting? What I would want to know about them personally? Yep. Um, I guess, you know, if, if they have a family who who cares about them, like let's say if they had kids, for example, given the crime that they've committed, right. if they if they have kids um, and they, they still, you know, care for their children, um, and, and that's established, um, you know, I would, even though you know, I, I believe it would personally be hard for a child to visit their you know parent in, in prison. Um, to know that someone is still alive that still cares for them, even though that they can't personally be with them, um, I, I think that would be something that I would be more towards you know life in prison rather than the death penalty. Okay. Uh, would you be able to follow the law that the judge instructed you and in, and in weighing the mitigators and the aggravators when you're making that decision? Thank you. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said, sir. Yes. Okay. State, do you have any questions? No, sir. You wish to give him a card? Yes. Okay, with the state to give him a card. Mm -hmm. Sir, yes, thank sir. you. I, I'm going to let you go today. I'm going to give you a card here with a number on the back. Mm -hmm. If you'll please uh, call this number uh, after tomorrow, uh, tomorrow after 5 p.m. So you don't need to stay today and you don't need to come back tomorrow, but if you can make sure you call that number after 5 p.m. tomorrow, there'll be some information about what else you need to do, if anything. Okay. Okay? You understand? Yes. Thanks for bearing with us. He'll give you that card. You're free to go. Thank you. I'll make sure you have a good day. Have Ms. Nikolaitsky. Susan Nikolaitsky. Susan Nikolaitsky. Susan Nikolaitsky. Susan Nikolaitsky. Susan Ma'am, up here, please. Thank you for bearing with us, ma'am. Thank, right right Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, you're not in trouble or anything, anything wrong. We just want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folk for just a few minutes. So if you can just make sure you speak up for us and be as candid with us as you can, okay? Yes. Michael Letsky. Michael Letsky, I'm sorry. I won't make you say it back at all. Pardon me? I won't make you read back at all. <laughs> That's my name, sorry. Um, you, we brought you in because you had indicated on your questionnaire that you have been exposed to some uh, media. And then today, I think the judge asked if you'd seen anything since we brought you in to do the questionnaire right. and it, it indicated you had. So let's just start off from the beginning. Tell us in as much detail as you can what it is you think you know about the case and tell us the source of that information. Well, it's everywhere and it has been since it happened. Um, newspapers just even before coming here. Mm -hmm. I am perplexed because my first picture of him, he had braids. Okay. And to see him now, he's totally changed. All right. I wonder, I'm almost curious if it was the same man. Okay. Because the appearance is so changed. But what, I, I understand you said the media is saturated with yeah. the case. What, tell us, what we need to know is what do you know or think you know? Well, I just know what I've read and which has been, you know, the evidence that the newspapers reported always on the TV no matter what channel it's on. Okay. Uh, the circumstances surrounding the scene, the crime. Okay. I know I keep like 
harping at you. And just, I just, yeah, if you ask me a question. You don't have anything specific. You're just saying generally you familiarize yourself with the case through the media? Yes, I would say so. All right, so now I know you served on a jury previously, oh, yeah. right? So you understand the, the role of the rule of law in a criminal proceeding. That the rules are, you got to follow the law, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. So I start off by saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with a juror reading the newspaper. In fact, that's exactly the kind of juror we want, somebody who's involved and interested in their community. And unfortunately for you, it doesn't necessarily disqualify you from jury service because you have read something about the case or even because you formed opinions about what you read. I mean, that's the point of reading a newspaper is to, to, to draw your own conclusions and opinions about what happened. But I start off with this question. Do you think that there are occasions when the media gets it wrong? I believe so. Okay. Nobody's perfect, sure. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm kind of saying do you believe everything you read? No. <laughs> okay. And then oftentimes I use the analogy of a guy by the name of Robert Jewell. Do you remember that name? You ever remember hearing that in the news? Is that the, uh, the bomber at the Olympics or something? Yeah, right. That's how you remember him as the bomber at the Olympics, right? Okay. You're right. And that's the guy they accused, and that's the guy they arrested, and that's the guy they took the boxes out of his house, labeled FBI or whatever. And guess what? He's not the guy who did it. Right? So the media can get it wrong, is my point. So let's start. From that, do you agree with that? Somewhat, yeah. All right. As the defendant sits here today, the Constitution says you must presume him to be innocent. Okay? That's the law. We're in a court of law. The only question for you is, can you follow that instruction on the law? <laughs> I've never been put into that situation. I, I would have to think about it, but um, I can't really give you a yes or no on that. Okay, so the, the answer then is you're not sure in your own mind whether you could do that? Correct, I think so. Based on what you, you learned outside the courtroom? Or what's to come. Um, yeah, that's where I stand, I guess. Okay, all right, and that's kind of what we need, need to know. All right, okay, thank you. Nothing further? No. Thank you, Mr. Foster. I'll stay out of objection. No objection. Um, Ma'am, I'm going to excuse you from service. Uh, I appreciate you bearing with us. Uh, I know it's been a long couple of days for you, uh, but, but I do want to thank you for doing your civic duty with us at least the time you were here. So I'm going to release you. You don't have to come back today unless you want to. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, up here, please. Thanks for bearing with us. Come right up there to your left there in the front row, please. Right up here. I need to take a seat right there. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with us, ma'am. Uh, you're not in trouble. You have anything wrong. Don't worry. They just want to talk to you outside the presence of the other folks for just a few minutes. So if you'll just make sure you speak up so we can hear you. Just be as candid with us as you can, okay? Good morning. So a couple things, Ms. Roach, we'd like to talk to you about on your questionnaire. And the first has to deal with media exposure. Um, we're going to start off by just saying, um, you know, we're in a court of law. You've never been a juror before, right? No. Okay, so the long and the short of it is there are a set of rules that apply here. They are the law. And every juror must agree to follow that. Mm -hmm. Because the point is, everybody who walks through that door should be assured that they're going to be treated just like everybody else who walks through that door mm -hmm. as a defendant. So starting with that starting point, there are a couple basic premise of law I want to discuss with you. First is the presumption of innocence. You heard of that? you got to speak up because they're recording okay. everything. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means every defendant charged with a crime in this country must be presumed innocent at the beginning of the trial. Now, to be sure, that doesn't mean they are innocent. That just means you start the process out saying he's innocent 
And then, who has to prove his guilt? This is a question for you, the uh, task. Who's going to prove it? Uh, uh, That's right, the, the government lawyer, the state, right? Because what we did is we said he committed a murder, and when your government says that about one of your fellow citizens, they got to prove it, all right? And we prove it in a court of law using testimony and evidence. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, state calls deputy X. And that deputy, she's going to walk through here. She's going to take that witness stand. She's going to raise her right hand. She can tell the truth. Take the oath to tell the truth. And you're going to listen to her testimony. And you're going to look at the evidence. And at the end of the case, your verdict, this is the law. These are the rules. Your verdict must be based on what happens here in court. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. So, I say to you, there is nothing wrong with reading the newspaper. There's nothing wrong with having information about a case. There's not even anything wrong with forming opinions. But what we need to do is to make sure you're willing to follow the law, to honor your oath, and to leave that information you discovered outside and render a verdict based only on what you hear in court. Okay? Okay. So, I start off by saying, tell me what it is you think you know about the case and tell me where you learned that information. Because believe it or not, sometimes what we find out is we're talking about a whole different case. Mm -hmm. So tell me in as much detail as you can what you think you know about the case. Um, I just know what, like, I've seen it on Facebook, I've seen it on the news, and then I was reading last night, or I was watching the news, and they were talking about the jury selection right. tonight, or today and yesterday. Okay. And that's basically all I know. And, but when you say you saw or had seen it in the news or whatever, do you have details? Or are you just saying generally I know it was in the news? Well, yeah, um, just that the police officer was shot. Okay. Anything else that you can think of? Any other facts or details? No, not really. Okay, and based upon just that little bit of information, you formed opinions? Um, no. Okay. All right. So, let's go back to our little civics lesson we just had, because I know you're paying attention. <laughs> if you're selected as a juror in this case, will you promise the judge that your verdict will be based on what Daryl and I do here in court, what evidence we present to you in witnesses and evidence and exhibits. Can you promise us your verdict will be based on that? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Now, everybody that comes through that door, your fellow jurors, all have come from various walks of life. That's what the system's all about, right? This jury of our peers. And they have beliefs and they have opinions and they have theories, and that's all great. That's a great country, we're all entitled to those positions. But what happens when you come here in court? What controls when you come in court? This is a test, it's, I'm asking you for an answer. What controls here in court? The law. Speak up just a little bit because we can't hear you. Try to speak up just a little bit. Okay. I think it's the law, right? Yeah. Okay, so the rules that we've been talking about are what control here in court. So you can have any kind of an opinion on any topic or any subject you want, but as, when you come into this courtroom, you must leave your opinions outside and render a verdict based upon the judge's instructions on the law. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, great. Now, let's talk a little bit about the death penalty. You've indicated that you have a, uh, you, you're entitled to your opinion, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that opinion. But to the extent it is not consistent with the law, I need to get a commitment from you, one way or the other, that you'd be willing to follow the law, because we are in a courtroom where what controls? The law, you're catching on, all right? So, the judge read you the law. And he said there are certain things that must occur before you can vote for death in a first-degree murder case. The first is there's got to be an aggravator. I'm not going to go through this again because we'll talk about it a lot. And then you've got to find that that aggravator warrants the death penalty. Like, for instance, an aggravator is killing a child. And you may say, that's so horrible in my mind. If it's proven, it's got to be proven because we're in a court of law, 
it could warrant the death penalty. But even if you find there's aggravators that warrant the death penalty, you've got to look at mitigators. Mitigators can be anything. It can be somebody's background or how they were raised or whether or not they wet their bed till they were seven or whatever the case might be. If you think it's mitigating in nature and you think it outweighs those aggravators, the law says you have to vote for life. That's the law. Can you follow that law? Will you promise us, despite whatever opinions you have, which are completely appropriate, that you'll set your opinions aside and follow the law in this case, both in the guilt phase of the trial and in the penalty phase? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Roach? Hello. I just have, a, I have some questions for you about the, the media exposure and just kind of what you saw in the news. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, I was taking notes when you were talking to Mr. Back at all, and it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you, you were exposed and, and you know quite a bit about the case, right? Um, I mean, I'm just, what I've read online and what I've seen on the world. Okay. When, let me just kind of back you way up. When was the first time that you, you remember hearing anything about the case? Oh, probably a couple years ago whenever it was, when that all happened. And how did, how did you actually wind up hearing about it? Did someone tell you about it, or did you watch on the news, or did it? I think it was on the news and Facebook, probably. Okay. And how did it make you feel when you, when you first read about the case? Um, I mean, it was upsetting, taking someone's life. Very upsetting. And just like you said, it's, it's been a couple of years. There's, I'm sure you know, there's there's been media coverage talking about this case all the way up until today in the camera in the courtroom right now. Um, have you been watching the news and, and kind of following along over the past couple of years, the updates? Um, no, like here and there, but not, not like continuously, no. Okay. So just maybe once every month or so, or? Yeah, if that. If that? Mm -hmm. uh, the media started kicking up again as we were getting closer to trial. Was that starting to pop up on your on your Facebook wall? Yeah, it was. But okay. I mean, I just scroll, and sometimes I click stuff to read, and sometimes I don't. Did you read the, the comments too? No. So um, recently, in the past few weeks, um, how many before before you came in and, and filled out the questionnaire? Of course, last week, but. In, in like the two or three weeks before that, how many how many times do you think that you saw something about this case popping up? Whether somebody shared it or a news organization that you that you follow posted something or on the last couple of weeks, probably at least like ten or twelve times. It's pretty well, it's like on the Facebook everywhere on my Facebook. Wow. Mm -hmm. How do you feel actually sitting in the courtroom right now after having seen all that? Um, never. <laughs> okay. Fair. So, you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were one of the people that, that raised their hand and said that they that they saw something? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, tell me about how that happened. Um, I came home from work and I just looked at the channels and I was what time did you want to get home from work? About 10.30, 11-ish. At uh, night? Mm hmm So was it that, that was a yes, right? Yes. Okay. So that was the, I, I'm guessing you caught the 11 o'clock news? Well, yeah, probably. Was that, uh, do you remember what channel you wound up putting it on? I did not. Was it a, did you turn on the TV to catch uh, national news or to catch local news? Um, it, it was just scrolling through the channels and then yeah. News so it was while you were flipping channels? Yeah, it was right while I was going through the channels. And um, when you saw that they were talking about the case, you stopped for a sec to hear what they were saying? Yeah, just for a second, and then I changed it. And um, when you saw that they were talking about the case, you stopped, you listened for a second, and then you and then you uh, changed it, right? Yeah, well, I probably more than a second that I listened to it, but then I did change it. Okay, if you could, please tell me about what you what you remember hearing, because there's, you know, there's different channels, 
saying different things. So it was just about the jury selection um, going on, and then it had a, they they had some other stuff that worth questions. I'm sorry. They had some other like questions that were said during court earlier in the day, and then that was it. Uh, okay, so like film of um, film of some of the lawyers getting up talking to people, or what do you mean? There was just it was, I don't know the questions. So like yeah, questions that the lawyers were asking the jurors. Okay, all right. Um, do you remember if it was uh, me or Mr. Backdahl or Ms. Aldonio, guy or girl? No. And um, how many how many lawyers do you? I'm not expecting you to remember our names or anything, but how many lawyers do you think you remember uh, seeing talking to the jurors? I don't remember. And then did you um, did you recognize any of the, the jurors, or did they not show their faces? No, they didn't show faces. How long would you say that the, um, the story was that you watched? Mm, maybe. Three minutes. It was when, when I was watching it. Okay, so it was only about three minutes long. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, I see you nodding your head, but Sorry. remember, it, it it has to be picked up by the audio. Okay, and um, when I was when I was reading your um, your questionnaire, and, and like I said, I'm not, I'm not faulting you for, for any of this. I'm, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to find out what, what your um, what your feelings are, okay? On um, your questionnaire, you indicated that, that you got exposure to the case through uh, newspaper and television and, um, and Facebook, too, and clearly got quite a bit of exposure. And um, and it was asked as a result of anything you've seen, heard, read, discussed, and you formed any opinion as to guilt or innocence of the accused, in this case, uh, Eris Tisdale. And, and you wound up checking off yes, and if yes, please explain, and then you, you hand wrote, I believe he is guilty. Mm -hmm. So is it is it fair to say that, um, and again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but um, is it a fair statement that that Mr. Tisdale would be starting off at a, at a disadvantage with you? Yeah. Okay. All right. I appreciate your time. Um, um, I, I, okay. Um, I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you. Judge, if we can move at this time. No objection. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Roach, I'm going to go ahead and release you. I, I want to thank you for bearing with us and, and doing your duty with us. Uh, we appreciate it. I know it's been an imposition of your time.